Thank you for joining me. I'm Sean from Infantry Base Academy. Today we are going to be doing a webinar about reports and I thought it would be really useful to look at three key areas about reports in regards to descriptions, pictures and reports. So that's what our webinar is going to be about. So you should all be able to see on your screen infantry reports, it's all in the detail. And the reason I've chosen this as a subject for today's webinar is the fact that I am often getting a lot of discussions around the detailed reports, what's good, what's not, and some key components of what reports should have. And one of the questions I am often answering and having discussions around is about descriptions and whether less is more. Also about pictures, quality and focus, what pictures should be, what they're not, and also why you should always be reviewing your reports. Descriptions, I think, as we all know, are a vital component of the report. What you have to bear in mind is that the reader relies on the descriptions and you're telling a story of the property. That's exactly what you're doing because that person's never been at that property before. So they have no idea, no understanding of what that property is going to be like, what the issues are, whether you know there's problems in regards to maintenance, whether there's problems with how cold it is, how warm it is, the fact that you can't necessarily ventilate it right. They're not going to know anything around those kind of issues unless you tell them so your report is effectively a story of the property in order to convey that story your reader needs to understand the components of the issues and it acts as a guide when completing the checkout and certainly on the infantry based system the report when you go from infantry to checkout will automatically bring all the descriptions and the detail across and then you'll be able to see not only what the written word is but you'll actually be able to, be able to see the pictures as well so from a point of view as maybe your clerk is doing a report one day and a different clerk is doing the checkout at another point they'll still be able to see all the pictures is understand what that report is telling them and be able to make sure that they're in the right room commenting on the right issues. And the other component of the report is the ability to enable the adjudicator to make a fair and reasoned judgment at dispute stage. They're not going to be able to do that if you don't have the right kind of level of detail in the report. So you've got to make sure you're telling that story. And that detail, that information is what provides the evidence. It's not just the pictures and this is something that we talk a lot uh, on the training course within inventory based academy is the fact that it's the written word that is the important part and the pictures provide that evidence to substantiate to effectively provide that objective evidence for that report it's not a case of one or the other they're both combined but you need that written detail because that's how the person understands what it is that you're saying and then when it comes to the actual pictures of it, they then can see what you're saying. So the two are intrinsically linked. You need one, you need the other, but it doesn't mean then that you can just rely solely on one or the other in regards to your evidence. You need to be able to produce both of those. So you need that detailed description. You need that detail in regards to the picture. So that said, the adjudicator who all your reports should be aimed at, in my opinion, then understands what it is that they're looking at and so they can understand what your report's trying to convey. So a very simplistic way of looking at this is starting off with a brief description. And I have seen this description on countless reports before where the person is saying, door, it's white. Great, lovely. Okay, it's white. I don't have any other information. I don't have a picture. I don't have anything else. So what am I meant to do with that from a adjudicator point of view? If for argument's sake, there's damage being shown and I'm trying to understand from an adjudicator's point of view as to exactly how I can then effectively either compensate the landlord or if not, argue against the landlord in regards to giving the deposit back to the tenant because the tenant's saying it's all pre-existing. You know, there wasn't any issues, but it's not captured in the report or there was pre-existing issues and it's not captured in the report. So door white isn't going to tell me, isn't going to tell the reader anything. Again, I see reports say door white lever handles. Great. OK, I'm one step further ahead, but I'm really not understanding much more about that door. Uh, most doors do tend to have handles on some form or another, but it's still not telling me much more about the actual item that's being described here. I don't really understand anything more. Next bit of description, door, white, lever handles, lock, no key, perco chain. Right, now I'm getting an understanding of what 
is actually being described here. So from that, I can gather, yes, it's a white door, it's got a lever hand, it's got a lock, no key, so therefore, can it be secured? Does it need to be secured? Could it be an internal bedroom door? Or what type of door is it? But it's also got a perco chain. And a perco chain is normally a door that's got a, either an outside door or maybe a door to the kitchen area where it needs to close because of fire resistance. So it's a fire safety door. So I'm now starting to get a picture of what that door is and what it isn't. And then I go one more step further. I've got white brass effect lever handles so I've now got an actual better description I've not only got the handles I actually know what they're made of or the coloration the fact that there's no key so that's great I understand that perco chain and now it's part glazed so by adding and by being descriptive in your descriptions I can understand so much more about what it is you're trying to tell me I can understand that it's a door I can understand it's got components so therefore if any issues then arise going forward at checkout anything is missing anything is damaged like the glazing's damaged perco chains missing quite often we find uh, tenants will actually take out or dismantle the perco chain or it actually isn't even attached to the uh, frame at the beginning of the report or the tenancy rather and in the report it means then it could then be a fire safety hazard because that door's not doing the function that it should do so by going from white white lever handles and then talking about the actual type of handles the lock whether there's a key where there isn't the perco chain whether it's park place gives me the reader the effectively the adjudicator at some point um, if it has to go that far a much better understanding of what it is that um, is being described to me so i can understand then where the issues are or with this description there's no issues everything is absolutely fine because if there were i would say that in the condition so therefore that door comes back and it's missing the handles, it's missing the lock, that the, gla the glazing is damaged, cracked or missing. Equally, that there's a key there where it wasn't beforehand, I would be using that information to inform on the checkout. But I can't do that if I don't have the information in the first instance. So I'm always saying to anybody that I train or I talk to when talking about um, descriptions is that you need the detail to be able to obviously take that report forward so that the reader can understand it and understand what it is you're saying. So again, we're going from white, white lever handles to lock, no key, to brass effect lever handles, lock, no key, perco chain, park place. So we're getting a lot more information. So don't rely just on the bare minimum. Quite often I will come across reports where everything is either white or it's painted or it's wool but there's no colour, there's no plaster, it doesn't tell me whether it's plaster fish, it doesn't tell me the type of lighting fittings, it doesn't tell me about the switches and the sockets or the carpet type, it doesn't give me any information and I need that as an adjudicator but equally I need that at the, at the checkout clerk, I need that as the landlord, as the agent, as the tenant to understand what is it that I've got to be responsible for as a tenant so I know I can give it back in the same order, less fair wear and tear or I'm the landlord and this is the property I'm giving over for the you know, safe use of the tenant for the quiet enjoyment of the uh, tenancy so that I know that they have the property that's safe and secure and fit for purpose. From an agent point of view, I'm looking at it from a maintenance issue. Do I need to do any maintenance? Is there anything I need to be aware of in regards to any potential problems coming up, i.e. the perco chain is not fixed and could there be a safety hazard? Do I need to fix that? Do I need to give them a key if it's an external door so that I can make sure that that property is secure and safe, especially under fitness for human habitation? And from the adjudicator point of view, that I can understand the level of detail um, when it comes to checkout so I've got something to balance my argument against I've got information I can work with and from us in regards to the actual checkout itself what I'm also looking for is that information so I can then look at the door I can understand what was originally there and then I can see what's there now and then I can comment on the difference i.e damaged not damaged items missing door missing which happens quite a lot or there's the key net there that wasn't there or the lock's damaged or the lock is missing so if I don't have that detail at the beginning I then can't draw a parallel when it comes to the end now that's a very simplistic way of looking at descriptions but I think it's a really good and clear way of understanding that that if you want to rely on the detail at checkout you need the detail at inventory I'm always saying to clerks don't 
rely on the bare minimum. If you see it, it's there, put it in. If you see that it's a, it's got lever handle, see that it's got no key, the fact that it's part glazed, it's got a lock and perco chain, say so. Don't ignore it because that will then potentially cause you, you problems at checkout point, but also problems for the reader to understand what it is that you are saying. So as part and parcel of that, you need to not only say it, you need to be able to see it. Pictures, and as we've got here, quality and focus, is one of the problems that I'm seeing more, 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 more is the fact that we're getting pictures, but sometimes you either can't understand what it is you're seeing, they're blurred, that they're not really in focus so you can really understand and see the detail, or they're even missing, so you're missing that vital evidence, and it's going to hinder your checkout process. The way it will hinder it is, is again, you'll have the written word, but you won't have a picture to understand what that looks like. And it also means then when you come to the actual checkout, you're going to be looking at the detail, but don't really understand what it is you're seeing. And you then might not then be able to draw a, a confident and competent parallel. Um, Julie, you said um, we only put key if there's one. We don't say no key. OK, um, the reason I would say no key, one is a belt and braces approach. It's a case of saying, well, there is a lock there. But because there's no key there, there could be a need for that key. It could be um, you need a key for the window, a key for the door um, to lock it, to secure it. It could be that it's a HMO or a student place where there should be a key and they've got no way of securing their items. So it's a way of really understanding what it is that there potentially might be an issue going forward. And if you say no key, then that should elicit the response of where, where is the key? Should there be a key? Does one need to be provided? If it's for window, yes, for one, for security, for safety, but also to act if the window is locked and you need it as an exit, you know, should it, there be a fire or be an issue. Key in regards to making sure the door is secure, so the property is secure, so the landlord's asset is secure, so that people can't just walk in. That's a requirement under fitness for human habitation that you're able to secure the property but also that you have the ability to secure your own items if it's like i said if it's in a student place or if it's a room in a rented house you've got the ability to close your door that becomes your safe space your quiet enjoyment of the property and also so that it's a way of ensuring that you are then responsible for that area i.e you have the key you have the lock it's up to you who goes in your room or not, and then obviously about minimising any potential damage. So by saying no key, hopefully we'll elicit that response. But um, you said we record keys separately in the report. If it's missing, then we said the point of the lock in the report should you not be recording them in a separate section. For us, we record uh, keys separately in the report. So we've got, like you do with the health and safety section, so you have the smoke alarms and then the key section. Itemise what keys there are, but we also record them or not where they are within the actual report itself. So if there's no keys to the window, we'll not, we'll not only say in the report um, at that key section, but also within the actual main body of the report. So very, very clear, again, a belt and braces approach. And making sure that, again, if they're not in the lock in a, like I said, a door student room or an external door and there needs to be one or it's not even locked, quite often we, we come across that. We go into a property and the back door is actually either opened or not secured and there's no key to secure it. We need to be recording this and also letting the agent know because if we're leaving the property and it's not secure, we need to make sure that that actually is dealt with urgently, especially if they may be the agent or landlord isn't aware. They thought the key was there and it's not. And quite rightly, the tenant, from their point of view, if they're coming in, especially if it's checking, they want to know that they can actually lock the property up and also be understanding of the responsibility of how many keys that they've got to give back at the end of the tenancy. So hopefully that answers that question. So for me, putting in about the key really helps the reader understand, especially when it comes to the checkout, understanding how many keys you should have back, what type they are, what function they are, if you go into that detail. And also from an adjudicator's point of view, if a, a landlord basically saying, I gave them five keys, I've got four keys back, I've had to relock, so I'm not sure that I've got all the keys back, the report will help substantiate that claim or not as the case may be. So you can only say what you see at that point in time. I think by saying that, 
a few short words, literally second worth of effort from our point of view, it conveys so, so much more than is if we just ignored it and didn't leave it in. And then that opens up a whole raft of potential questions going forward. So for me, I believe put it in, then it's very clear, very concise, easy to understand. It sets the kind of like scene, it sets the story for the adjudicator to understand exactly what it is that they're looking at, what they're reading. They've got all the information and that effectively, I think, is our job. We give them all the information. It's then for them to make a decision as to what happens potentially to the deposit if it's subject to a claim. Hopefully that answers both your question, Julie and Samantha, but do come back to me if you're not sure. Again, with the, get back to pictures. So with the pictures, the pictures effectively make the, the report objective. So it goes from subjective to objective. So it goes from opinion of what we're saying to objective to say that we're not only what we're saying, but what we're showing. But if those pictures aren't any good, they're out of focus, you can't really understand what they're showing you. They really haven't been taken carefully enough then you're going to miss out on vital evidence. You are going to hinder your checkout process because, again, you're going to be looking at your app, looking at the report, looking at the property, and it's not it's not marrying up. It's not making any sense. So that's going to cause you both time, effort, and potentially miss on certain aspects and certain issues. And also, I think it looks unprofessional. And that's not meant to be rude or derogatory because I see huge amounts of examples and reports where they are extremely professional, really well done. But an unprofessional report will stand out, a, an out-of-focus picture will stand out, people will then focus on that and then will ignore the rest of the report. So you need to be paying attention as to what you're putting in the report, but also how it's being seen and looked at. So if you've got an out-of-focus picture like this, I can't tell anything. Can anybody tell me what this picture is? Any idea? Oven from Samantha. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, I can see potential components in there. But I can't tell. I mean, I obviously I know what it is, but you can't tell. And the thing is, if you've got that in your report, how can you tell? You might be able to tell if it's in the right field, but if it's in the wrong field, if it's not clearly been attached to the right description, you are not going to know. So you, you, you need to pay attention to your pictures. So in focus, there you go. You've now got a integrated dishwasher. So completely, you go back. You wouldn't necessarily understand it. You'd probably guesstimate if you knew what it was and said, yeah, I can kind of like see that. But from here, you just can't see that. And again, from a reader's point of view, you might have your description, but if your description isn't detailed, if it doesn't say what it is, it doesn't say the type of unit that it is, it doesn't say whether it's a well pull, whether it's integrated, whether it's got the pull-out trays, whether it's got the cutlery tray, um, so it can function, or whether it's clean, or whether it's not, whether it's damaged or not, you're not going to know. And the person at the end of the report isn't going to be able to understand that because they just don't have the information. And again, that goes back to what I was saying at the beginning. Your report is a story. Um, it's a story for the person to be able to understand what the property is, what it includes, what the issues are or not, as the case may be, and then act as a guide for when it comes to checkout so that you can give a balanced report to the adjudicator. So why pictures important, uh, important, excuse me, sorry, Julie, dishwasher filter, check and photograph. Yeah, I, I do, definitely. I always take a picture of the dishwasher washer filter, just pull the tray, one picture in, takes again, half a second you know just about the same amount of time as it takes you to think about it but provides so much evidence because if you've got that picture of that filter if it's clogged if there's water standing in the base there's also an odor you'll be able to get that straight away then you could argue well is that unit actually working so when the tenant comes to it the tenant might say actually it's not working or it the filter's blocked etc and you they've already got the evidence to say that something might be wrong equally if it's nice, it's clean, it's clear, there's no issues, then the tenant comes back so it's not working, or it's damaged, this, that, and the other, you've got the photographs to actually say, actually, at the point of tenancy, at the point of inventory or check-in, that actual unit was, was working, or at least it was in physical good condition, or however you've described it. But again, without that picture, you won't know that. So you're giving not only the adjudicator and everybody else involved in the tenancy process all the information, you're also giving yourself that information to be able to then work out at checkout where the difference lies. And again, without that, you're not going to know. For me, pictures are important because they identify the room or area. So for me in our reports, um, we do one or so two pictures, two landscape um, of the room. So we know, we know in the right room, commenting on the right things. 
And as I said earlier, it takes evidence from subjective to objective. So we're going away from just being our opinion to being our opinion and fact, because we can prove that. And that's the difference with taking a picture and not having a picture. And it also gives an immediate understanding of issues. It's the same as any kind of picture. If you look at most pictures for anything, even including the picture I'm showing you here in the slide, you can see the type of property it is. You can see the order it's in, whether it's clean, it's tidy. You get a general understanding of what the issues are or are not. So, but without them, if I just wrote that, that there was a low level gray futon with one, two, three, four, five, six cushions, one footstool, a gray mat, planted parts, um, bookshelves with numerous books, etc. I could tell you that, but you wouldn't necessarily understand or appreciate that that's what I'm seeing. And then I've got no way of showing you that unless I give you those photographs or video, if that's something that you use. And as I said, they're a fabulous resource at checkout. Certainly within the infantry base system, you'll be able to see all the previous pictures. You'll be able to understand you're in the right room. You'll be able to look at the pictures of the items. We always take one picture per appliance. That way, then again, you get that understanding and then you go into the issues and the model details, etc. And that way, then when you go back to that report and you're looking to see the differences and, and get that side by side view, you can view those pictures, understand what it is that, that, that you're seeing. And then you're looking at the property and go, right, am I seeing the same thing? Has there been any material change? If so, what is that? Is the property in worse order? Is it grubby? Is it marked? Is it damaged? Are items missing? And certainly with the items missing, if you have two pictures per room, you get an immediate understanding. Well, hang on a minute, this picture or these items aren't either in the right place or I can't see them. You get that immediate understanding, which means then you go looking in regards to where are they, you ask the questions, and then you can then decide on whether there's a liability there i.e the items completely missing or why are they missing has anybody given permission has the landlord left uh, removed them has the tenant removed them they damaged and it will prompt you to ask those questions but without that information you just won't do that because you will have to take everything as read because you've got no other evidence for that so that's why it's a really good resource at checkout so you're pictures identify the room they take the evidence from subjective to objective it gives you that immediate understanding gives all the readers that throughout the tenancy process that understanding of what that report is and is saying to you and said so in that resource at checkout this is another reason why i thought we would look at why you should review reports now for me auditing a report is an absolute must i do 100 percent audit on all my properties that come through me so that both uh, my clerk and mine and actually sometimes i'll actually ask my clerks to look at my properties because i'm still a hands-on clerk i'm still producing reports because i will miss things i'm human i you know my head says i'm seeing one thing and i'm saying one thing but on the written paper or on the, on the system on the report it's saying something completely different so I'm happy to get someone else to review my reports. I've got no problem with that whatsoever, um, because sometimes that's, uh, that other view, that second person to have a look over my report really helps me understand if I'm missing something, if I could do something better. And just because I, I do reports and I train people doesn't mean I get it right every single time, but I, I'm very keen to make sure I do the best that I can and I'm constantly learning. So by auditing your report, you're giving yourself the ability to run feedback to your clerks, but also to see how your business in, in itself is developing, you know, where there's some shortfalls, maybe there's some training needs that you need to address. And those audits are, are relatively straightforward. I think with the format with inventory base and with the report preview that you can have, it's very easy to run through the report, have a look at it, see where the issues are. I do check for grammar and spelling. I think they're really important. It's no different to having decent pictures on lot and that to convey in uh, the report and showcase what it is you're seeing. Um, because if your report looks professional, people will take notice of them, notice of them and that report and other reports, because it makes the reader effectively view your report. It's no different if you pick up a magazine or pick up a book. If it's well ordered and you understand it, and you get it, you can appreciate it and you're more likely to read it. If it's all over the place, if there's spelling mistakes or it doesn't look good or it's not well presented, then you will switch off. And that's a natural thing. I do. If there's something that's that there that I think, oh, my God, you know, you, the, the spelling is terrible or I really don't understand. It's all complicated. It's all a bit messy and, and, and I'm not really getting it. Then I'll switch off. I'll go somewhere else and read something else. And you don't want people doing that. You want people to look at your report and go, wow, 
that's a really good quality report. I get what they're saying. That makes perfect sense. And I can see what they're saying. That is a professional report. And that's all we want at the end of the day. Because if we do that, then we're more likely to get a good pay rate per report so that you know we can grow our businesses, we can pay our clerks well, and we can be recognised for the job that we do. So checking your grammar and spelling is vital as part of the audit process. And it's not particularly difficult. And certainly with inventory base, it does spell check to a certain degree. And, you know, you have the ability to obviously go back and correct those mistakes before they go over to the client. Because again, you want the client to get the best impression of both you and of your clerks as you possibly can convey. And also look at your descriptions and your conditional comments. Often I will go over those and think, actually, I can see what you're saying, but it's not said in the right way and make amendments or just change a few things so that one, in a way, I'm saying put loads of detail in, but equally I'm also saying don't put it in so much that you literally write warm piece and the person then switches off because they just it's just too much. They can't get through it. it doesn't it, It's just too much information. So it's about being concise. It's about being descriptive and being objective, but giving over the right information. So look at your descriptions and your condition comments and say to yourself effectively, do I understand that? Does that make any sense to me? If I was a third person part of party, if I was the tenant landlord or the adjudicator, could I understand that? And make sure that information matches the room. There's been a lot of times when I've had other people's inventories and I'm looking at what they call bedroom one or bedroom two or bedroom three and they're not marrying up with the information that I'm seeing it, it's, it's just not right they're in the wrong order or I don't understand what order is and then I'm trying to work out from the description as to which room I'm in but if that description isn't there I've got no way of understanding I, I really can't tell so I need to be able to or your clients need to be able to understand that what they're reading is correct they're in the right and room having you know looking at the right information and it matches what it is that they're seeing so you know if it's a blue wall you would expect to see a blue wall in the photograph equally if you're in a blue room and the photograph is showing magnolia wall is it the same room or are you in a different room or is just a room being repainted and then the question then asked was permission given if so who was it and then if they have repainted has it been painted to a good standard so it gives you the ability to ask questions but you need that prompt you need that information at the first point to be able to even ask the questions because otherwise you're just like well it's magnolia i don't know whether it was blue because the description doesn't tell me whether it was blue so therefore i've got no idea therefore i have to take it it is that and then you literally have to wait until the landlord comes back to you either screaming shouting or equally they might be happy as well they might be in a better order than what the uh, property was given out but you don't know so again you need that information and as i was saying earlier it identifies training and development needs because we all get things wrong we all need training in some way or another um, i'm constantly learning i think every single day I, I learn off my clerks i learn off my clients of my reports and what i see from other people's reports sometimes i think it's a really good practice from other people's reports thinking ah that's a really good way of doing that i could really adopt that equally i see some that i think no that could be done a lot lot better and they're missing it you know missing vital evidence and that could cause a problem going forward so I'm always looking at what I need to do in order to both train my clerks, look at whether we need to either develop the templates or develop the staff or to develop even the clients. And I know that's probably going to sound a little bit weird, but I often find, and I don't know if you guys do, is that we train the clerks as much as we train, or sorry, train the clients as much as the clerks. Because I sometimes think that some agents, some landlords don't necessarily understand what it is that they need. They kind of know what they want, but they don't know what they need. And now one of our jobs is to tell them that, you know, often they want a report that's very basic getting back to the descriptions it's white this wall, uh, clean walls or clean carpet and nothing else they want a bare minimum but when it comes to checkout they want everything so you have to kind of like almost train them into understanding what each report does what you need from it and what they need from it and then they get understand better what it is that you're trying to provide as a report so development needs doesn't necessarily mean just your clerks or your own staff it can be also the clients you work with and certainly 
my experience, my personal experience has always been that whenever I've spoken to clients, they kind of have an understanding. I want a report. I want it this, that time. Or I want it to do this, that and the other. But when I question them about that and when I question whether they want a level of detail and why they should and what, what it should include and what it shouldn't include, they're learning from that all the time. And then I'm learning from them. So, you know, it's something that I think we're doing constantly, but maybe we're not necessarily doing it consciously. So have a think about that when you're auditing your report. The other thing, obviously, with the auditing report is GDPR compliance. That is extremely important at the moment. If you've got client details within your report, so for argument's sake, you've got names, telephone numbers, contacts, but then that report then needs to close because there's a checkout and that's not going forward. Then under GDPR, you really got no basis, no legal basis to keep that information. But because it's in the report, the only way you're getting rid of it is either opening the report, which probably by that time it's already archived, or deleting that report because you could be a subject of an SAR, subject access request, um, where a tenant says, well, I think you've got details of me on your system that you shouldn't have, and you do, but it's in the report, and the only way to get rid of it would be to delete the report. So always think about what your GDPR policy is, but also what you've got in regards to uh, the report itself, what information you've got in there, does it need to be there, could it be somewhere else? A good way of me explaining this is a lot of my clients initially wanted us to take the tenant's forwarding address details. Now, pre-GDPR wasn't really seen as an issue. It was seen as a a reasonable request. They just want to know where potentially to send in deposit information and also send any further information going forward in regards to issues, et cetera, et cetera, or even mail. But when GDPR came in, then it became a bigger issue because now those that those tenants information was kept in the report and then when it comes to the end of the tenancy legally we can't keep it in there but we would have to delete the report so have a think about what needs to be in the report do you need those tenants details can they be somewhere else like in contact information and make sure that your reports are compliant equally if you're going to be putting a sample report up on the inventory based system for work streams make sure that there's no sample report you give over into like the workstream system so there's no property related details addresses any client details and also any tenant details julia you've asked a question declaration on the report has tenant name and email for signature i do not delete the report as needed for the checkout and that's absolutely fine because under gdpr um, you still have a legitimate interest in order to keep that information up until that tenancy is concluded i.e at checkout so once you get to that point, then realistically, you don't, you, you know, you can keep the report, but you shouldn't have any tenant details in there. So inventory based system as it stands at the moment will automatically delete any contact details at point of checkout. So once the report is done, it's completed, that tenancy is finished. That information will be deleted from the system because there's no legitimate interest to actually keep that. But if it's within the body of the report, then the system can't take that out. It has no way of doing that. So that's why, from our point of view, we've got to make sure that we check that and that look at whether we actually need those contact details within the report or whether that could sit somewhere else like contact details. Because under GDPR, you can only retain personal information, personal details for the purpose that you need them for, i.e. at inventory, then at checkout to deliver the checkout report. But after that, you've got no legitimate interest. So just make sure that however you configure your reports, however you put the detail in there, uh, make sure that you have an ability to take it out. You, t- you, you make sure you redact it uh, either regularly or you do it so that you use the contact details so that you don't need to keep that information. Audits also act as a barometer of service delivery. They mean that you're constantly looking at how you deliver your report, making sure that you're doing as much as you can to provide a very good professional service and gives you an ability to see whether there's anything you could be doing better as you go along. And it also encourages professional reports. So I'm constantly looking at our reports that we provide to our clients as to how they look, how they come across, what we could do better, what information should we be including that actually will make the quality report even better than it is. Could I be included, uh, including better information regards health and safety around keys, around the actual detail of the report? What can I do to make it better, more functional, and actually provide and do the job that it's meant to do? And it also means 
you're maintaining continuity across your service so that all your reports no matter which clerk has effectively delivered that report compiled that report on your behalf they're all doing it to the same kind of standard and that means then no matter who commissions your service and whatever clerk you use your continuity of service remains consistent all the way through no different you know when you ask your clerks to how they talk to their clients you know how polite they are how they present themselves your report should be looking looked at in exactly the same way uh, because it is a reflection of you your service and also hopefully the barometer for, for other people to look at your service think actually that's the kind of service i either want to emulate or i want to actually encourage or outsource to or use and it also enables continuous personal development so that if you're constantly feeding back to your, your clerks and your clients, it means then you're developing your knowledge base all the time. So you're taking into consideration not just what you knew yesterday, but what you know today and what you're potentially going to be learning tomorrow, bearing in mind what's happening, certainly with the market at the moment. A lot of things are going on at the minute. And it means then, you know, we're constantly having to make sure that we do the best service we can so that we keep the clients coming back to us. We can build our services. We can build on our number of clerks that we work with, build our business reputationally and also financially. So from an audit point of view, it actually does a huge amount of work. For, I would say not so little effort because it takes effort. It's not an easy thing to do. It's depending on how many reports you do. But you'll soon learn what clerks you need to maybe concentrate and help and support more and what clerks are absolutely fine and that, you know, you can rely on them and you can just literally skim over to a degree in as much as that you know that you can rely on them to, to deliver, but you still keep an eye on them. That's why I do 100% audit. I think that works really well. And then I can feed back to the clerks and let them know how well they're doing, whether anything needs to be picked up on, any more training that I need to give them, and also how I'm delivering my service on a day-to-day -day basis. As a recap, descriptions is less small. I think you can say a lot in a very short space in regards to the detail, but you do need to make sure that there's a description there. So you can say door white, it's a door and it's white, but you're not going to get any more out of it. But so if you give the information, then you've got a detailed description, but you're not literally saying one piece. You can say door, white, lever handles, perco chain, lock, no key. Or you could say door painted white with a yellow lock that is brass effect. There isn't any key. There is a perco chain, but it's not fixed to the frame. You can condense that down so you can be very descriptive. And in a way, by being descriptive, but almost like bullet point, you're actually conveying quite a lot, but with very little or reduced amount of words, but you're being more efficient with your time, which means then you're more cost efficient. With regards to pictures, again, quality and focus, making sure that the pictures you take have a purpose and make sure that they um, actually convey what it is that you are trying to tell the reader. Showcase the fact that the report is giving over the objective information that you are trying to convey to all the readers. And make sure they're in focus, that they produce a professional looking report that people will both read and seek out and rely on. And that's what you need to, to be focusing on. And then what reports why you should always review. Again, audits will give you a huge amount of information, a huge amount of detail in regards to how your service is functioning, where you could do better, where you're doing extremely well, and where you just need to kind of keep on doing that kind of level so that you keep your clients and then you gain more clients, hopefully through word of mouth, through reputation, which is where most of us or a lot of people that I speak to get their work. And I certainly get my work that way. We don't tend to advertise. We tend to let our reports do the advertising so we will give a copy of a report to a client a redacted one of course a sample report and that acts as a barometer as to the kind of professional service we provide how our clerks are delivering the report how they are viewed and that in nine times out of ten means that we don't really need to do much more than that in order to get the work and touch wood um, that will continue but it's something I'm constantly always looking at and constantly always focusing on just to make sure that we are delivering constantly to a good quality a good level so that at the end of the day the job the report does the job it's meant to it's protecting the landlord's asset but also it's protecting the tenant's deposit and sometimes i think uh, as clerks and certainly myself we lose a little bit sight of that we think well it's for the property yes but it's actually to protect the deposit as well both so that the landlord can access it if they need to 
or the tenant can get it back if uh, the property is given back you know in good order less fair wear and tear so it, when you think about it a report has a lot of functions and it's just about thinking about those so that we do and deliver the best service that we can Hopefully that has been useful, got you thinking about reports. I could definitely talk a lot longer about such things. And if you do want some more information, you can see my contact details here. You've got inventorybase.co.uk is the website. And you can also get me on shana inventorybase.com. So that is our webinar today about inventory reports, about bit the detail. If you do have any other questions, let me know. I am intending on doing more cool short webinars, half an hour, 45 minutes. So if there is anything specific you would like me to focus on or to have a discussion about, then do drop me a line, do drop me an email at shannetinventurybase.com and we can look to focus on those key areas because I think there's a lot that we do as infantry clerks that we could potentially build on, do better and also get more recognition within the industry, which is certainly something that I and Infantry Base and Infantry Base Academy are really keen on doing. And just so you know, we're here to support you. We've got the Facebook support hub as well as obviously the podcast the webinars and the blogs that we produce. So again, make sure you avail yourself of those. And if you do have any questions going forward, then just drop me a line and I will get back to you. So thank you very much indeed for your kind attention this afternoon. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and thank you very much for joining me at Inventory Base Academy.